Welcome back. Well, it's another brutally hot day today. Uh, we're probably at 90 already, and if not, we will be very soon. Um, definitely not my favorite weather, and it's still just the very beginning of June. I cringe to think of what it's going to be like come August. Um, Audie's here with me, as you can see. Um, and, and he's showing us his face instead of his butt, which is a really big deal. So, yeah, no. But I don't have the kitchen table in front of me. I have a smaller table, and I have that here for a reason. Well, today is Sunday. As you know, Sunday is our project day. And what I have here is um, the components of a somewhat messy, but very simple, quick, easy, and remarkably inexpensive project. So, when we get back. we would talk about a fun project today. Just a little bit of whimsy. And so what we're going to take a look at is fairy gardens. So what is a fairy garden? Well, most of us have seen them. They are little plantings. Often they are terrariums. Sometimes they are in a sheltered section of the garden outdoors. Uh, Usually, they are protected. They are indoors because of the nature of these little plantings. And it's um, an assortment of small plantings paired with fairies. A little fairy houses, sometimes it's little, little fairies, little tiny ceramic or porcelain or even pipe cleaner fairies just living among the plants. So you've got your plant and you've got your little fairy sitting at a little fairy table with a little tiny fairy china and they're reading little fairy books and they've got a little fairy house in the background and most of the time I look at this and think to myself, whoever made that has an awful lot of time and an awful lot of money on their hands because that had to have cost a fortune for all the supplies and look at the time and labor and gee they have to be so talented because they're working with things that are this big well okay maybe that's certainly one way to go but i don't like projects that take a great deal of money and a great deal of dedication and learning and oh when you Boy, you need a degree in engineering to do this. No. I like projects that anybody can do. Yeah, that your stupid cousin, the one who could barely learn to eat with his fork when he was five years old, you know, if he could do it, that's my idea. By the way, I had one of those cousins. I know that was awfully specific. It's because I have one. If he can do it, my idea of a good project. When we start talking about flowers and plants and gardening, well, that's not really my thing. I do fairly well when it comes to stuff growing outdoors, but when it's growing inside, my mother had a green thumb. It just, it passed me by. I, in fact, I don't know anybody in the family who got it. I think she kept it all to herself. Certainly, I didn't get it. This is my idea of a good houseplant. This is a miniature orchid. I get these for under $10 at the grocery store. I believe this was $8.99. Um, I got a friend. Again, $8.99. Didn't even have to go to a special store to get it. Just went right into the grocery store. You're going in for your milk, your bread. Stop, grab your little orchid. It's under $10 take it home with you. Well, an orchid like this can sit in the corner of my kitchen, minding its own business, taking care of itself. It, if it's 
good. I'll throw a little ice cube in it once a week. Everything will be fine. Everybody's going to be happy. I don't have to worry about it. It takes care of itself. Um, I have never had any luck getting them to rebloom or, you know, grow beyond this. So I usually just treat them like cut flowers when it passes, or when blooms go, you know, it basically passes on. And But on the other hand, by then I've usually had it for at least a month or two, which for me is a very long time to keep an indoor plant anyway. So, hey, what can I say? When you get your little orchid like this, it comes in a pot. The pot is nothing to write home about. Um, some people actually choose their little orchids based on their pots. As far as I'm concerned, we're going for the little orchid. Now, here's our little orchid. We take it out of our pot, and it has this little... Can you see how flexible this little plastic container is? It's, um, it's, uh, it's almost as flexible as cloth. It's a little tiny bit of plastic that is holding the root ball. That's all. So, that's what we're going to work with. Now, the whole point of the fairy garden is to mix uh, some growing things with some unexpected, interesting, eye-catching whimsy. That's all. And that's why I prefer to think of them as whimsy gardens rather than fairy gardens because I don't think you need a fairy or, you know, little specialized miniature whatever to get the same general look and appeal. I'll show you what I have. I have a whole bunch of orphaned and broken china. This is a teapot. It's a very pretty teapot, but the spout is really chewed up. Can you see in here where that spout, and it's broken, um, it's all glued together. It's This is useless as a teapot. Even if I were going to fix it, I'm still missing that little spout piece. I, I got this knowing that it was broken. It's not like I'm unhappy with the person I bought it from. They were very honest about the condition of the piece, but I very often get large assortments of china, as you know, because I will want a few pieces for whatever purpose, and I will end up with a few orphan pieces. And so I I have to ask myself, what is going to become of the orphan pieces? This one, by the way, had a lid. That's rather unusual for some of my orphan pieces. So we've got a teapot. All summer long, Starbucks produces these strange and different flavors of iced tea, and they throw them in these little plastic cups and give the little cups away for free. So here is a free Starbucks cup, a teapot that is basically a total loss. It's If I can't find something creative to do with it, it's, it's useless. It's, it, it can't be sold, and it can't be used for the purpose for which it was intended. So, basically, junk, junk. As it happens, that little Starbucks cup nestles very neatly on the lip of this little teapot. So let's set that down, and let's grab this. All right, here is our little orchid now. Let's see, I'm gonna say this is the front. That kind of looks like the front to me. There you go. Now, we've got our little teapot, our orchid. Because it's a white orchid and it's mirroring these little white cherry blossoms, it looks cute, like it was made for it. Here's a little bit of moss. Um, because I keep orchids, I tend to keep little bits of moss laying around. Um, inexpensive. I usually grab these in packages for a couple of dollars at Michael's. You get a package, it'll last you about 10 years. It, it really is just there. Here's my little whimsy garden. It's that simple. 
I'm going to set that aside because actually this is going to go in the corner of my kitchen just like this. Voila! You saw how fast and easy that was. Now, what happens if you don't have a teapot that matches the size of your little Starbucks cup? And that was just pure luck, that's all. Um, I grabbed the teapot, I grabbed the Starbucks cup, oh wow, it worked. Got another teapot here. This is a smaller teapot, no lid. Um, as you can see, this doesn't fit. But remember, I can just squish this a little, see, and just shove it in if I wanted to. No big deal one way or the other. So this is very conformable. If I have something larger, I've got all kinds of strange little stuff. You've seen the styrofoam peanuts I take in, little excess bits of bubble wrap, a little crumbled up newspaper, anything. Um, paper cups. These are little paper cups. They've got dinosaurs on them. Um, they go in bathroom cup dispensers. They're the teeny tiny ones. Take something like this, cut three quarters or an inch off the top, turn it upside down, and it will act as a stand. So, you know, you can create a little height inside a container if you need to. Frankly, something like this could fit into a little orphaned demi-tasse cup very easily. Do I have a little orphaned demi-tasse cup? All right, we're back. A little orphaned demi-tasse cup. Here we go. Just like that. Actually, let me take it out of this. There. Um, it's a little loose, but of course, we'll shove a little bit of moss in there. Like, seriously, that's all it took. Um, in this case, our little uh, demi tasse cup is a nice little rose medallion piece. Anything you have, little bits, and we all have them, things that we like that uh, we, we don't have a use for. Um, like I say, a stray cup, a little rose medallion demi tasse cup just sitting around. Why not put it to use? Why not drop a little orchid in? Couldn't be easier. Again, whimsy. Just a little bit of unexpected. Um, here we go. This. Well, here. I know this looks like a plant, right? No. Here's the plant. Here's the planter. I grabbed this off the patio earlier today, and I pop this out of the yard. Set that down. This. This is a classical ruin. It's also a bit of fish tank decoration. Very inexpensive. You can get all kinds of things. This happens to be a ruin. Uh, I have seen everything from alien autopsy skulls to Easter Island heads to um, to full-blown hobbit houses. If you really are determined to take your fairy garden into that true fairy garden look. So let's just throw this in. There, there we go. Here's our little plant. Nova survives all this ill treatment. Here. What could be easier? That simple. You have your little bit of unexpected in your plant. Did it take me days, weeks, months? It, it didn't even take me seconds to do this. So let's take that out and just take a look at something else, other stuff. This is a little tiny teacup, which can very easily nestle in with the plant just for a little pop, a little unexpected. Do you remember these? One of our viewers sent a couple of these in. These are little 
or toothpick holders or ashtrays. I'm not really sure which. Here we go. Just something so that when you come over and take a second look at the plant, oh my. And that's the whole principle of a fairy garden, to provide a little bit of unexpected in with your plants. It can be anything. I would favor the little aquarium decoration for a couple of reasons. First of all, wildly inexpensive. I don't recall what I paid for this. I, it couldn't have been $10 because, frankly, I wouldn't have paid more than $10. If somebody had said, I'll give you that for $12, I would have said, no, thank you. I'll find it at a junk shop. Very inexpensive. And anything you could imagine. Little crashed UFOs. What the... F anything you could imagine little crashed UFOs, whatever. And all you have to do is just get yourself a little pot of whatever. In this case, it's just a little bit of ivy. It can be something much more elaborate or involved. Many little plants, little tiny alpine plants work very well in this sort of setting. And drop in your little fish tank items. Some of them are just remarkable. So, if you want to do a fairy garden, it's just this easy. Now, as I say, this, this one is staying just as it is. I'm going to find a little home for this. I'm not quite sure which. It's, but it's going to go into something. And I am going to give you a picture of this, of what they look like sitting in my kitchen. Because that's the whole point of this, just to create a little extra surprise somewhere, just to brighten a corner and, and create a little pop. Can we do it? Of course. You saw how easy it was. And keep in mind, I have teapots. I, I have all kinds of little bits of china kicking around, mostly because I collect them for use with my tidbit trays and what have you. You may have other things. Um, you may have interesting little pieces of jewelry. That's one I can absolutely see. Just a shiny little, you know, earring or something dangling from um, the little orchid support. That's the principle of a fairy garden. Does it have to be fairies? Does it have to be little miniature whatevers? No. In fact, you're probably better off bringing your own taste to the fore, using your own creativity, and creating your own whimsy garden. So, go have some fun with this. I'm sure you can, and let me know how you make out. And I will, in fact, show you where this is going. Um, because as soon as I finish filming this, I'm going to take everything over and snap you a picture. All right. Let's take a quick... Because the last two videos, we didn't have a chance to do this. So let's just see what we've got here. Oh, right. Tuxedo, polite name for wolf. Speak of the devil and he will appear is old superstition. For this reason, savage tribes would often invent roundabout names for things that they feared and did not like to speak of directly. In one dialect of American Indian, I seem to recall there were about 600 Native American languages. This guy has issues with everybody. Um, for instance, a wolf wasn't called a wolf. That would have been dangerous. The name they gave this savage beast was 
Patuxet. Patuxet sounds like a town in Rhode Island. Uh, he has a round foot, which was their subtle way of avoiding any direct mention of the animal. And from, tux from Patuxet, we develop our name Tuxedo, which in turn gave us the name for the tuxedo coat that we wear on formal occasions. Way back in 1814, Pierre Lorillard and his grandson acquired the land around Tuxedo Lake, about 40 miles from New York City. Uh, an exclusive residential community was founded there in 1886, and within eight years, Tuxedo Park had become so socially important that its name was given to a new style in men's dinner coats, the tuxedo. Thus, thanks to the Indians, but unknowingly, many an eligible bachelor goes clad in wolf's clothing. Well, I'm reading this for the first time. So what this is telling me is that when he speaks of that dialect of American Indian, he is probably talking about Wampanoag or Narragansett, which are the two tribes that were in the area of Patuxet, Rhode Island. I'm going to have to look this up. I bet he's leaving a lot of this story out. Whiskers. Hey, Audie, this is all about you, baby. A wisp of straw. Nearly all of these hirsute words have their traceable history. Whisker is, t is taken from whisk, as in whisk broom, and whisk probably once meant a wisp of straw, which is pretty much what the adornment looks like. That rarity of Van Dyke beard is easier to pin down. You'll discover it in the great art galleries attached to the chins of those aristocratic Flemish gentlemen whose portraits were painted by Van Dyke. If you happen to cherish a professional goatee, you will find that goatee means just a little goat from its resemblance to the unsuave fuzz on the chin of that animal, while the word mustache has percolated into English through French and Italian from the Greek word mystax, meaning upper lip. But then there are those archaic sideburns where the fluffiest part of the whiskers were on the sides of the face. Grandfather knows that they were named after General Ambrose Everett Bird Burnside, who sported them first when he was a Union leader in the Civil War. No one knows how Burnside got turned around into sideburns. The other is Barber, who trims all these, traces his name to an old French derivative of the Latin word barba, that means beard. All right. Sideburns turning in, uh, uh, turning from burn sides to sideburns is obvious. We have several words like that. Uh, the most common they say is flutter by turning into butterfly. So it's not unusual for things like that to happen. Burnside actually had a name that lent itself because the side whiskers were on the side of his face. Um, my favorite, by the way, was General Hooker, and guess what got named after him? Um, interestingly enough, the descendants of General Hooker uh, were at one point trying to campaign to get um, the public to stop using the word Hooker to mean call girl because they said that it defamed their ancestor, General Hooker, but in fact, Hooker did come from Hooker's girls because they did follow Hooker's army. So, and you can't change language that easily. And let's see, what else do we want to pick out here? Mustache used to be mustaches. It was once a plural. So we've had some fun with those words. And yes, it's pretty clear that he's picking on everybody. Um, this man was certainly a product of his times, and his times were not exactly highbrow. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Uh, I will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow we are doing the second half of 
our um, Bedford trip, and that was the follow-up Bedford trip, the one where I said I didn't have enough time, made more time, and still said I didn't have enough time, that's tomorrow. Have a great day. We'll see you then.